Uh, my second wife, uh, rather my third wife, it was my second wife, no, it was my third wife. <laughs> we divorced, unfortunately, and I married her divorced sister. <laughs> she was beautiful, what can I say? I was a WWA president. I was president of the American Public Health Association at a time when only physicians were president of that august body. I was also ASCE vice president. But most importantly, George Fuller was responsible almost single-handedly for creating standard methods. He was the chair of the first committee. He was the bacteriologist that essentially codified the total coliform test. And through AWWA and through all the various committees, he created the standards for AWWA, what we now know as the Standards Council and the AWWA standards. Without George, uh, it would not really have happened for decades afterward. He really took a, what was a social organization where people got together for a good time and turned it into a modern scientific body that did technical work. This quote um, is from a Call, uh, a, an employee of his, believe it or not, um, who uh, really respected him, as you can see. Fuller had a pleasant personality and an almost overwhelming one. He was genial, courteous, courteous and very impressive. You can imagine, just look at that face. <laughs> he could turn on the charm when he wished and vary its type with the person or audience. Uh, uh, side note, he had piercing blue eyes, and the spectacles did not keep him from boring into you if you had done something that he didn't care for, or they could twinkle uh, with the, 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 the sight of a, a lovely young woman in the audience. He was a good storyteller and a brilliant conversationalist. He was normally dignified, yet warm, but he could be very much otherwise when he felt so inclined. <laughs> Reading between the lines, George Warren Fuller was indeed a piece of work. Uh, how many people have been to Jersey City, New Jersey? Not a soul. OK. <laughs> That's why I put this up here. It's in northern uh, New Jersey on the, uh, the Hudson River, just across from Manhattan. Uh, it was, at the time, a city of about 200,000 and it needed a water supply because the one they were using was contaminated. So they contracted with a private water company, and private water companies were very important in New Jersey for the development of water supplies during this period. And in this contract, the private water company was required to provide a pure and wholesome water supply. So the dam was constructed on the Rockaway River, and the pipeline, 23 miles long, with a tunnel, was built to Jersey City and finished in 1904, and water was then delivered in May of that year. Well, what about the watershed? <laughs> well, there were privies hanging over rivers and creeks in just about every major uh, water course in the northeastern United States. This is the standard of construction, believe it or not. I, I couldn't believe it when I first saw it, or has anybody seen Slumdog Millionaire, the, uh, the movie? No joke, folks, that's what they did. And Dr. John Leal, who you'll hear about in a minute, was responsible for going out into the watershed and finding these privies and having them removed. And he did uh, a bang up job with it, in fact, even took uh, people who would not comply to court. But there were still some sanitary problems, uh, still uh, high bacteria counts. Well, Jersey City was not satisfied with the work that the private water company had done. They didn't think that the water was pure and wholesome, so they hired a consultant. That was their first mistake. <laughs> This consultant looked for problems, and of course, indeed, he found them using the burgeoning, uh, really just beginning methods for bacteriology, found that indeed the water, certain times of the year, coming into uh, Booton Reservoir, the water was contaminated. And he wrote, this uh, George Whipple, wrote a letter to the Board of Water Commissioners and raised his concerns. So shortly thereafter, a lawsuit was filed 
against the private water company, and the central question was, were they providing pure and wholesome water? The judge, after hearing testimony over some 40 days, found that indeed there was, the water was qu of questionable quality two to three times per year. The reservoir actually did a very fine job in its, with its detention time and sedimentation of, of uh, reducing the bacterial load significantly, but guess what? When it rained and the water short-circuited across the reservoir, the bacterial counts were very high. And they, at this point, they were able to do monitoring on a daily basis to actually determine this. It's really the beginning of bacteriology in our industry. So the judge said, okay, you've either got to put sewers in in those small towns in the watershed or develop other plans or devices for maintaining the purity of the water. Dr. John Leal is a major uh, part of the story. He was a physician. He's not a physician that uh, started out as a barber and then ultimately hung up a shingle. This was a physician that graduated from Princeton undergraduate and Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1884. He was health officer to Patterson, New Jersey in 1890 to 1899. And he left that, that post at Patterson, New Jersey and left almost completely his duties as a physician to become the sanitary supervisor of the East Jersey Water Company beginning about 1899. And as the sanitary advisor to this private water company that was embroiled in this lawsuit, it became clear to him that just building sewers was not going to solve the problem. As you can see from the quote, I decided that the process indicated was the practical sterilization or disinfection. This was truly revolutionary thinking. And in testimony, his testimony in a second trial, he said, I then proceeded to take action at once. On the 19th of June, I engaged the firm of Herring and, Herring and Fuller to build a plant. A plant that had never been built before, never been envisioned before, never been conceived of. I gave them orders to go on and build this plant. The construction was begun at once, and the plant was put in operation on the 26th day, September last, 1908. 99 days. 10 drawings, 10 engineering drawings, 99 days. To say the least, we couldn't do this today. This is a photograph from the time. This is Booten Dam, the reservoir is behind it. This is the valve house, which still exists today. I visited it several times. This is actually the, what they called the sterilization house, which housed all of the addition of chemicals, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Unfortunately, that was demolished and no longer exists. Well, what did they use? Well, it was J John Leal's desire to put a poison in the water supply. And this was really the incredible uh, decision that he made. He knew about chloride of lime, which is essentially calcium hypochlorite, because of his role as a health officer. Calcium hypochlorite, or bleaching powder, was used in a variety of industries. It was used to bleach linen, shirts, and it was also used by public health officers to disinfect homes by using a solution of it to wipe down the walls, boil the uh, uh, bed sheets, and, and other uh, problems from people who had communicable diseases. And it was being made in this country, in Niagara, New York. It was about 35% available chlorine. But how do you apply it when you've never done this before? Well, it's one of the reasons why he hired George Fuller. And of course, these guys knew each other. They had been on committees together and the New Jersey Sanitary Association, the American Public Health Association. They were colleagues. George Fuller, in 1902, recall that the Little Falls treatment plant had designed an alum feed system where taking uh, powdered alum, which was 17% aluminum hydroxide, and creating um, a very concentrated solution, which was then put into these mixing tanks below, stirred with purged air, and using centrifugal pumps in duplicate, always a good idea, was pumped to two orifice tanks, which were in a continuous state of overflow. 
thus maintaining a constant head. And out of the bottom of those orifice tanks were rectangular slots with an adjustable sliding cover. And through that, with the 1% solution that was created here, they were able to add small amounts of chlorine very carefully and very reliably. And this was, but this was the alum feed system at the Little Falls plant, a 32 million gallon per day plant. Oh, by the way, just a, a small matter, at the, the Booten Reservoir, we're not talking about treating four gallons a day. The size of this, this chlorination facility was 40 MGD. So they went from bench scale to full scale, 40 MGD, nothing in between. I mean, you talk about a lot of guts. It really was a courageous thing to do. So as you can see, the design of the chloride of lime feed system was very similar. It had these concentrated tanks which, with stirs. They were put into these mixing tanks or solution tanks where they created about a 1% solution. You'll note that they don't use air to purge and mix the solution. Probably not a good idea to take a 1% solution of chlorine and blow air through it. So they recognized that. They stirred it. Again, belt-driven turbine pumps to a constantly overflowing tanks with the slotted uh, uh, rectangular slots and the ability to measure that with a micrometer screw. A couple of additions. Anybody know what a BIF recorder is? There's still a couple in use in the, in the industry. 1908. It was being used back then and was recording the level in these tanks. Also, they had a level indicator in the orifice tanks attached to a gong, so if it did uh, start to um, uh, you know, drop in, in, in head, drop in, in level, they would actually alert the operator. So it even had, quote unquote, automatic controls. This is actually a photo of the inside of that sterilization house. These belts were used to run the stirs, and you can see one of the sterilization tanks right there in the center bottom.